Hi, I'm Mark Mowinney, and I'm a results leader. You're listening to ResultsLeader.fm. Being a thought leader is easy. Getting results is hard. This show is for the results leader who lives and dies by their results. Here is your host and chief results leader, Jonathan Rivera. Yes, yes, y'all. It is time once again for another results leader.fm. We are the only show on the internet dedicated to the men and women who are getting results for their clients. Glad you guys are here. And as always, I've got a treat for your earbuds. I've got Mr. Mark Mawinney here. He is the man behind the Coaching Jungle Facebook group. He's also the voice behind Natural Born Coaches, his podcast. And he is a friend of the show who helps coaches get more clients without paid ads. Let's jump in with Mark. Mark, welcome to the show. Are you ready to rock this thing? I am as much as I can be. All right, brother. Well, let's give our listeners a quick win. What book have you given most as a gift? Oh, that's easy. It's uh, Thick Face, Black Heart by Chin Ning Chu. It's not a really well-known one, but written in the 90s. And uh, I've given that as gifts to clients, uh, subscribers to my print newsletter, and a whole bunch of people. So Thick Face, Black Heart. Never heard of it. That's a new one to add to the reading list. Thank you, sir. Let's get into story time, brother. Can you tell us a story of how an apparent failure set you up for later success? Oh, boy. So, well, the big one for me was I went through, a, say, a bad business closure. Never a good business closure, but uh, back in 2009 with my real estate business, you know, I'd build up a, a real estate company here in Canada and uh, build it up to about 100 agents and employees and had several sister companies that worked in tandem. Uh, with the real estate side of things and then everything came falling down so i went through a couple rough years after that getting kicked around and you know and stuff uh, but that's actually what led me into the coaching world which where i've been since 2014. Uh, so i wouldn't have begun i wouldn't have even really know what coaching was had i not gone through that uh you know business closure but i know it's cliche to say uh, when one door closes another opens or, or what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger but i think those would apply in that case I mean, tell us a little bit more about how you found your way from the real estate business closure to coaching. Like what led you down that path? Oh, like I mentioned, I had a couple uh, rough years where I went through another pickup. You know, those three years after 2009 were terribly rosy. So I actually hired several coaches and I think a, one or two would be considered mentors as well. And uh, that's what introduced me to coaching um, because I wanted to get back into business, but I was sick and tired of real estate, you know, with everything that happened. I'd been doing that, you know, since I was at a university at 21. So I was looking for something different. And uh, yeah, I thought, wow, this coaching thing's really cool. You know, you can work as long as you got internet, laptop, uh, work virtually with people and it kind of brought in a lot of stuff like personal development, things I've always been big on. So it was a perfect fit that way. And, and that's what really got me into it. What would you say is the most worthwhile investment that you have ever made? Well, you touched on it, I guess, earlier, uh, books. So this is audio, so people can't tell. That's one of my bookcases in back, but then I've got a bunch of other, probably 20 huge plastic tote boxes full of books and not including Kindle, audio books and all that stuff. So when it comes to books, I have pulled so much from them, you know, like if the house was burning, I know that there's certain ones I would want to grab and get out. If I could, I wouldn't risk my life because I guess I could buy another copy. <laughs> uh, but hey, and not just books. So your friend, uh, uh, Ben Settle, I've got a bunch of his email players, newsletters here. So I guess that's what I would say. So Ben's stuff and so on. But yeah, books are a great investment. I mean, I, I pull at least one really good nugget out of every book I read, but usually there's more than that. You know, I'm marking them up, taking notes, highlighting, and uh, it's great ROI. Oh, Ben Settle. Yeah, I just finished reading his newsletter actually for this month. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so what is your reading regimen? I mean, what do you do then? I mean, is reading a daily thing? Do you have a goal of how many books per year? What's that look like? Yeah, so I do, if I don't, well, I can't remember the last day I didn't read something. I'd be cranky if I didn't get a chance to read. I like to start my day by reading. So that's usually the first thing that I'm doing when my eyes are open. I like having that time to read and journal, you know, as I wake up. 
Uh, but then throughout the day or the evening, I'm sneaking in opportunities to read as well. Uh, so I have a goal every year, 100 books to read. Uh, now I cheat a little bit because I do audio books with Audible <laughs> and I go at 2x speed. So roughly half the books I read every year actually listen to their audio books. But um, that's my goal. One thing I have changed and actually speaking of Ben, I think he's talked about this too, is uh, focusing more on um, biographies than just strictly personal development stuff. Because I think you can pull a lot from biographies. They tend to be bigger. Like I'm God, doing one about Putin now that's six or 700 pages. It's a crazy long one. Uh, so now I'm less about the number of books because I think uh, that's a vanity metric. I did it for a few years. I went, yeah, I hit my 100 uh, books, but I would rather read like this year I'm on pace for I think 75, but I'm slowing down and really absorbing what I'm learning in there. So I don't get too hung up in the total anymore, but I do like to read at least an hour every day. What do you say to those people that, that think... 2x speed is just nuts. <laughs> I used to think it was nuts. Uh, a client of mine recommended it. And when I first tried it, it sounded like Alvin and the Chipmunks. And I'm like, oh man, I can't do this. And he warned me. He said, your first time when you start at 2x, it's going to sound really weird, but you'll get used to it. And and I can absorb it. Now, there's some audiobooks. I just finished listening to one. I went at 1.6x because two is going to be too much. So if it's a quicker or faster narrator, I will slow it down a little bit. But I try to listen at 1x speed now. Same goes with podcasts. I just find it too slow. I'm just like, oh, man. Really? On yeah. podcasts too? Yeah, I do with the podcast as well. I'm like at least 1.5 to 2. I, it's weird. Now that I'm used to listening to it quickly, I, it would sound like it's slow-mo if it's at normal speed. That's one of the reasons I didn't get into Clubhouse. I don't know if you got into that. Everyone last year was like, oh, you got to get to Clubhouse. You have to be on there. I tried it once, and I was just going crazy. Like, oh, man, because I couldn't speed it up. And I found a lot of wasted time on there. I'm like, I'm not going to spend eight hours a day on Clubhouse like a lot of coaches and online entrepreneurs are doing. And I'm glad I didn't because it looks like it's dying a slow death now, or it's certainly not the in thing like it was in January of 2021. But uh, yeah, I, I won't get into that. I'm not a huge Clubhouse fan. In the last five years, what new belief, behavior, or habit has most improved your life? Oh, geez. That's a great question. I don't want to say that, oh yeah, I've been perfect or as perfect since I started, say, online in 2014, but I've stayed pretty consistent. Um, well, again, this is a Ben episode, I guess, but um, I got into daily emails. Uh, ben basically convinced me to do that. I had him on my show uh, several times, and uh, I started doing daily emails in April of 2016, and I haven't missed a day yet. So I guess technically that's more than five years. That would be you know six and a half or whatever. But I think it's like 2,400 days or so of uh, daily emails. And that's been something I preach now. I'm converted. I'm one of the converts and I'm trying to get more people into doing it. I know you, same with you, you're big on daily emails and stuff. So I would probably pinpoint that. A lot of people, when I talk to them about daily email, hmm. they, they think I'm absolutely insane. Yep. So what are your thoughts? Like, is there such thing as too much email? Not if you're doing it right. I mean, if you're just sending junk out, then obviously. Uh, so What's doing it right? I mean, you can't just put that out there without giving yeah, us Yeah, doing it right. Well, so the way I write my emails is I want to make sure that people are rewarded for spending a minute, two minutes of their valuable time actually clicking on it and reading it. So most of my emails, I'll tell a story. Maybe there's a lesson, something that I want them to know before I go to the call to action. And it's not a twisting their arm, you know, home shopping network type pitch. It's, it's a lot like Ben, you know, I'll tell them what I want them to know. And I'll say, oh, by the way, I go over this in greater detail and module two of my XYZ program, check it out, you know, or something like that. Uh, so I want them to uh, at least be rewarded for their time. Uh, there's a book that I have, uh, Writing Without Bullshit. Uh, Josh Burnoff wrote it. And in that book, he has an iron imperative that he says, uh, treat your reader's time as more valuable than your own. So basically value their time. And that's something I try to, before I hit schedule or to send it out, I say, is this going to be worth their two minutes to read this? And if not, I'm, I go back and I redo it. Do you write those emails daily, like as in show up today and write an email for today? Or do you get a queue of them going? How do you do yeah, that? I, I batch them and schedule. So actually just before I hopped on here, I pounded out four of them. You know, I had some time and I did that. So now that being said, if something happens, uh, let's say later today, that's time sensitive. I think, oh, gee, I really love to get this in for tomorrow's email. I could just um, unschedule the one for tomorrow or move stuff around. 
But I just find it to be, and this is where I think a lot of daily emailers or people who try daily email fail and give up is they're writing the day off. You know, they're waking up, staring at the blank screen and I'm probably going to get an email out of it like to get out the next half hour and we get all stressed out. Um, I always like to have at least one week buffer, but ideally a couple weeks just in case life happens like, um, well, geez, years ago, four or five years ago, my dad was rushed to the hospital, you know, and he's uh, in another city an hour and a half away. And uh, my brother and I went down, got a hotel where it was kind of touch and go there for a little while. Uh, but my email still went out every day for that week that that was going on. People wouldn't have known the difference. Now, if I didn't batch write my emails, it would have been really tough to stick to a daily schedule, right? Because life's in the way, you got a sick father, all this other stuff. So I'm very grateful. That's why I, like, I sleep much easier having at least a week's worth in the can. What would you say are some bad recommendations in your area of expertise? In the coaching world? Well, how long is the show? I'm trying to think of the, the worst ones that I see and I just kind of shake my head. Well, one of them that I talk on often is uh, a lot of coaches are putting all their eggs in one basket. I gave the example of Clubhouse earlier, you know, if people had gone all in on Clubhouse, spent all the time and stuff like that, but then, and, you know, it sort of dies off, then what do you do? You know, you're back to the drawing board. Uh, so I always like to have at least a couple baskets, so to speak, you know, the, the big three for me I, is a podcasting, that's my show, but then also going out in shows like I'm doing now, community. So my Facebook group, The Coaching Jungle, got like 24,000 members in there. It's a big part of my business. And then email marketing and you know, specifically daily emails like we talked about. So by doing those three things, if Facebook goes away, the dodo bird, or, you know, I don't think it's going to happen, but podcasting, something happens, it's fine. You know, I've got other things going on and then I can just replace whatever dies. We interrupt your regularly scheduled program for a public service announcement. We're going to get right back into this show, but I wanted to ask you a question. If you have been listening to the show for any amount of time and you've picked up even one single tip, then I need your help. Get the word out. Tell people about resultsleader.fm. Share it on social media. Share it on your email. Share it anywhere. Hashtag resultsleaderfm. Now let's jump back into the interview. Mark, why do results matter? Well, results matter because uh, life's short. <laughs> so if you um, are spending time and energy doing something and you're not getting results, I think that's pretty sad and uh, disappointing. So I always tell people, uh, take for example, daily emails. Um, if they're not working for you, don't enjoy them. Do something else or find a way to fix it, see what's going wrong with it. And because uh, you deserve to get an ROI for the time spent. Mm -hmm. I find in the coaching world, online space, too many people are spending all their time doing stuff that just doesn't give them very good ROI or results. And uh, that's why I always work to change for them. In the last five years, what new realization has helped you get better results for your clients? I'm a recovering workaholic. I still struggle with that. I'm sure you know a thing or two about that as well. So uh, I've gotten much better in the last five years, not feeling like I have to work every waking moment. Uh, so if it's uh, enjoying the sun on the back deck here with a good book or the cold drink or something, I don't feel like I have to be, you know, have the laptop there working. So that's actually helped because um, my business, a big part of it is uh, creativity, content creation and stuff. So if I'm working 100 hours a week and I'm burnt out, then the content's going to suck. So ironically, by working less, I actually have better content, better offers better engagement with what I'm doing. So yeah, that, that I would say that's a big one. What kind of content are we talking about? Well, the big ones for me um, are what I mentioned, podcasting. Done almost 800 episodes of my show now. I, you've been on as a guest, so thank you for being on. I think twice, maybe. So podcasting is a big part of the content. Daily social media, but I'm really making an effort not to live on Facebook or these other places. Well, how do you protect yourself from that? Because that's uh, the slippery slope of is, yeah. and getting caught up in the feed and the comments. I, it is. I'm trying to do what I call drive-by postings. <laughs> so I hop on, I post, I have to post and I squeal out of there, you know, before I get stuck on it. So, but then uh, daily emails are the other part, but see, I can cheat a little bit because the daily emails that I create, they're the foundation of my daily content that I'm creating. The email goes onto my blog which I believe Ben does, um, he's recommended. 
And then that email also goes around social media. You know, it goes to three places on Facebook, goes to LinkedIn, goes to Twitter, goes all over the place. Uh, so one piece of content can be stretched out to probably seven places at the end of the day, which makes it much easier uh, with it. So I squeeze a lot of juice out of that orange. How's the drive-by posting working for you? I mean, some people say that you have to post and then back yeah. it up with a bunch of engagement. So how is it working yeah. for you? I'm not perfect with it, by the way, because I get stuck, like you mentioned, in the news feed or someone sent a message and you feel like you have to answer it. Um, I'll tell a really quick story to show how uh, dangerous Facebook and social media is. Years ago, I decided I was hungry. I was going to make myself a pizza, you know. So anyways, um, put her in the oven. It was supposed to be in there for 20 minutes. And I thought, well, you know, while the pizza's in the oven, I'll uh, go out in the living room, open up the laptop and just check my news feed, Facebook messages or whatever. What well, felt like five minutes later that the oven's beeping. And I'm like, geez, that's there hasn't been 20 minutes. What's going on? And I go out and sure enough, at 20 minutes, pizza's done, it's all cooked. And it, so, it was, so it was like missing time. You ever hear on those alien abduction stories where one minute someone's like driving home late at night from the factory and then the next they wake up like naked at some convenience store in the woods or something? <laughs> that didn't happen to me. But it is missing time. I'm like, that really, uh, math, it, it hammered the point home to me that oh man facebook's dangerous uh in all social media because it just sucks your attention in and it's designed to keep you there kind of like casinos you know casinos don't have windows they don't have clocks they have all these tricks to keep people from forgetting the outside world social media is the same way so i don't know if that answered your question how do i keep myself from being in there just being mindful reminding myself that the stuff's dangerous like crack cocaine or something you're like it's, it's not good i'm with you man i i don't even do drive-by posting because i'm just too susceptible to get pulled in and that's why i'm trying to look for tips I'm well, like, I, I give ben saddle credit because i think he got off social media and like facebook and stuff in 2018 or something he talked about maybe even before and uh, i'm not to that point yet because it is an important part of my business but if I could do my business and not have to be on facebook and stuff i'd gladly do it because I'm, I'm jealous of uh, i have a friend who five or six years ago. You ever see these grand declarations on Facebook when someone says they're done? You know, thanks for the memory, guys. You'll never see me here again. And I said to him, I'm like, oh, you'll be back. Because usually they come back, like, might be a month later, two months later. He still hasn't come back. And here we are, you know, 2022, 2023. He stuck to his guns. I give him credit because that, that would be very difficult. Good for him, man. Let's talk about your business. What area of your business would you like better results? I think it's like I touched on earlier, uh, the time part of it not saying I'd want to have a four hour work week. I would go crazy. Although I've gotten better, I'm still working too many hours and I enjoy it. It doesn't feel like work, but I'm um, Chris Miles. Uh, was a guest on my show, Money Ripples. And um, I'm jealous of Chris as well. because He makes really good money, but he has a system in place where I think he's working under 10 hours a week. I was like, oh, wow, that's crazy for the amount of revenue he's bringing in. So I need to do better there. What results are you most proud of? Uh, I think overall, if my business is just getting it off the ground and getting it to the point where it is now, uh, because coming off a of business closure, you know, a lot of people write you off that you're done. I'm sure it's like this where you're at Canada. There's a, almost like a scarlet letter, you know, you, oh, you had a business closure, you had a bankruptcy, you're done, go crawl in a ditch and die, you know, basically, and you're finished. And, uh, then people are surprised when they see you back up and running and, and that took a lot of work, you know, it took a lot of mind set stuff because it, that can get into your head when you've gone through stumbles and business closures. You know, I could have very easily thought, well, who am I to be coaching anyone? Look at this mess that, you know, I went through, but that actually made me, I think, a better coach and more empathetic because I know what it's like to have sleepless nights worrying about meeting payroll. And I know what it's like to have people, strangers attacking you or not strangers. And, you know, I've got to see a lot of stuff. So I probably learned more in those rough years than I did in the 10 years prior to that, which was almost nonstop success, no stumbles. So I'm, I'm grateful for it. I'd rather not go through it again, but I'm grateful for the experience. Any parting thoughts that you'd like to share with the results leaders who are listening to us right now? Well, just a, a book ended, unintended. That book I mentioned uh, at the beginning, Thick Face, Black Heart, I highly recommend uh, your listeners check that out. Uh, so it's not a well-known book. I say it's almost a cross between The Art of War Think and Grow Rich and a few other things kind of um, grouped together. But Chin Ning Chu wrote a book that's very much uh, understands the human 
condition how humans behave. It's not a warm and fuzzy, oh, everyone loves each other and they want uh, you know to help each other and all this other stuff. It's more a guide for how do you deal with humans because at the end of the day, the humans, uh, not everyone that dance around a you know a fire singing kumbaya, right? <laughs> and so it's a great guide for that, and that's why I love the book so much. And it's a type of book I usually read it once or twice a year, and I'm always picking up something new. So that would be the thing I would leave with: go buy that book. It's not always easy to find. You can get it on um, online though with Amazon and stuff. So just locally, it can be hard to find in bookstores. Excellent. I know our listeners are going to want more from you. Where can they get it? Uh, sure. So the main site is naturalborncoaches.com. And then the Facebook group, I'm in there, not all day long, as we talked about, but I'm in there a fair bit. And that's at notcoachingjungle.com. And the podcast is the same name, right? Natural yep. Born Coaches. Got her. Yep. Not Natural Born Killers. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's the uh, natural evolution. Well, thank you, Mark, for hanging out with us. Thank you, results leaders, for tuning in. Another episode is in the can. That is a wrap for another edition of ResultsLeader.fm. If you are out there getting results for your clients and you want to be featured on the show, go to ResultsLeader.fm now and apply to be on the show. And if you love what you're hearing, share the show, give us a rating and review, do anything to help us get the message out there. Thought leadership is easy, but results leadership is hard. We'll catch you on the next one. This is the podcastfactory.com.